Welcome to Almost Productive, a podcast mostly about marketing. I'm Sean. I'm Julie. I'm Addie. And I'm Ben. And we are all marketing professionals at New Boston Creative Group in Manhattan, Kansas. When we get approached by new clients interested in digital marketing, they often ask for help running social media. Whether organic or paid, social reigns supreme, for good reason. The cost of advertising on social media is typically much lower than print. You can get granular with targeting, messaging, and graphics. Plus, you can measure results in a more impactful way. But the downside is, you don't own that channel. Meta does, LinkedIn does, X does. There's a channel that often gets overlooked in digital marketing, but it's one of the most effective places to be. Email. Today, we're opening up about our inboxes. But first, a word from our sponsor. I've tried everything. Fruit diets. Protein diets. Cleansing diets. Nothing works. I don't know how I'm going to lose those 10 pounds before my wedding. My annual review. My high school reunion. Want a weight loss solution that's effective, lasting, and fast? We have the answer. Lose weight through organ removal. Organ removal? What's that? Organ removal is a patent-pending process that lets you shed the weight of unnecessary organs, then continue to lose weight through decreased bodily function for whatever life you have left. Wait, what? Think of all those unwieldy organs just taking up space. Did you know that the average spleen weighs six ounces? Six ounces? You've already got a spine. Who needs a bulky spleen? Tonsils? Save yourself two grams and your skin is driving up the scale by a whopping nine pounds. Join our countless satisfied customers and lose weight with organ removal. Thanks, organ Thanks, removal. Thanks, organ, removal. organ removal. What are you waiting for? Pick up that phone, call 1-800-555-LOSE now. The body you've been dreaming of is just an organ away. Or just be happy with your body as it is. I liked the edits, Julie. Yeah, I like that. Oof. What, what do you mean, Julie? That was straight from our sponsor, Organ Removal. I, I'm glad they made those edits, our sponsor, yeah. <laughs> to their company. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it is our podcast. Yeah. And so I think we do, you know, have a right to give them notes. Yeah. And uh, yeah. I think they took those notes and they did great. Yeah. For true, for true. Well, no would you rather question today. We have a new segment I'm calling Molly's Musings. So Molly is our content producer, and I, I've got to say, not a lot rattles Molly, but when it does, watch out. And today, Molly is on a tear about words that are spelled incorrectly. Hello, Merriam-Webster. Molly wants these fixed immediately. First up, the word kernel, as in, why, yes, sir, kernel, right away. So Molly thinks the word C-O-L-O-N-E-L should be K-E-R-N-E-L. Another one is hors d'oeuvres from the French. <laughs> Looks like horse duvers. <laughs> and Molly doesn't want it spelled that way anymore. <laughs> and let's not forget Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. How should Wednesday be spelled? Your thoughts? Yeah, I'm I'm pro uh, all of these, to be honest. I'm all about spelling things the way that they appear they should be. I know a lot of these words, like you mentioned, like they have history. They come from other languages. Mm. Uh, but, you know, I don't care like at all <laughs> about that. And I would rather this just be easy and simple. And so for me, it's an easy like, yep, let's change all of these uh, to whatever you propose that makes way more sense. I think Wednesday should be spelled W-H-E-N-S <laughs> question mark D-A-Y Wednesday. <laughs> to capture that true hump day feeling. Yeah, you're right in the middle. I don't know. Well, where, how far are we in the week? Oh, Wednesday. When when's the day? That would lead to a real who's on first, what's on exactly, second kind of situation. Mm. <laughs> it is perfect. 
Oh, I'm actually going to take the opposite stance. I'm a real stickler. I feel like history matters. And a lot of these words are rooted in other languages, like Sean said, but I do care. So I like that we kind of keep some of that spelling, in particular, the French word. Like that's just a French word that for some reason hors d'oeuvres we say in English. We didn't make up our own word. We just took theirs. So I think that because of that, we just stole it. We have to respect their spelling. We weren't creative enough to think of a new word for ourselves. Yeah. Well, to be fair, Applebee's did, and they call them apps. <laughs> <laughs> so when in doubt, just use just use apps, appetizers. Yeah, I'm, I'm also pro uh, letting Applebee's choose how we spell words. <laughs> 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 oh. what's a margarita what? i'm pretty sure it's called a dollarita <laughs> that's some free <laughs> branding for applebee's yeah not a got, sponsor uh, so yeah we got that <laughs> <Not a sponsor. laughs> and then we have apps and then they i'm pretty sure they came up with riblets i think that's theirs that right <laughs> i mean they were the people that were brave enough to put apples and bees together so really <laughs> they're doing something right right they are brave souls they're so brave I think Molly has a has a growing list of these words. Uh, can you all think of any off the top of your heads that you would add to this list? I'm going to stand firm in that I wouldn't like to change the spelling, <laughs> but one that always comes to mind is knife, K-N-I-F-E. Why is there a K? I don't actually know, but that's, yeah, that's usually Oh, so you went the after the word knife, but not the word no, which also has a silent K. Rude. I, mean, I, I think we can all agree, like, silent letters are ridiculous. And they have no place in modern language. Knock is a good one, too. Yeah, knock. Yeah. Oh, you know what? Uh, let's be fair. Let's take off both Ks. N-O-C for knock. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. Yeah, because I think the other thing we need to go for is efficiency. Like, you're typing two extra letters for no reason. Get out of here. Tradition. That's the reason. Tradition. This isn't even one of those words, but separate, that's a word that I always have to think really hard for. So for some reason, I'm like, yeah, it's like set and then perate, P-E-R-A-T-E. -E, and it's like, no, that is not correct. It's with an A. Where's that? Is that French too? Oh my gosh. I think mean, that's <laughs> French too. <laughs> it should be noted that I'm actually a terrible speller. So the stance that I have staunchly taken is actively against my self-interest. But I don't know why. I just feel like there's a reason for it, even if the reason is asinine. Yeah. Tradition. Spell asinine. I was right? about to say, is that one of them? Let me think. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you asinine. Yeah, there it is. I think my, this is obviously not the take I do when we're writing copy for work, but like in my <laughs> personal life, my thing is you can spell a word however you want if I can understand what word you're trying to spell. I do not care. You can spell it as wrong as you'd like. I will probably still read it. If I can understand it, because that's what communication's about. We're communicating ideas. Wow. Wow. So deep. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Opening minds, opening hearts. Well, with that, I guess we should get to our topic. Thanks for your thoughts, everyone. Really good stuff there. So uh, to kick this off, quick poll, couple of questions. How many email addresses do you all have? Think personal work and how often do you check them? your various emails in a day. Ben has two. Addie has three. Yeah, two as well. I think I have four active. Wow. One work, one personal for people who know me, and then two personal for spam for like, give us your email and we'll send you this. And one is very too personal. Yeah. Give us your email and we'll send you. No, that's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Terry... Oh, Get Terry. Out of here. Terry's always buttoning. Get her out of here, Terry. <laughs> you crazy Terry. All right. So in our little uh, sample set of data here, what are some things that make you open an email and click on an email? So what'll make me open an email is that it arrives in my inbox because I can't have an unread notification anywhere on any device. But to click on that email from there takes definitely takes a lot more uh, something more enticing for me to to actually make that effort that is going to just throw it in the trash. Would you ever just right click and mark is read? You'd actually open? Yes. 
Yeah, it's it's like a, it's like a present. I want to see what's inside, and then I'll judge it accordingly. Okay, so you'll never just delete it without reading it. No, I will always at least take a glance because I'm I'm also uh, anxious enough that I'm afraid I'll miss something that I was supposed to see, and I either thought it was junk and it wasn't junk, or you know, some I'll, I'll be like, oh, what was that? Did I need to read that? Crap. So you would never be one of those people that could have that, like, 989 unread emails. No, no. It, if, I mean, if I see my email and it's a two-digit number, something has gone terribly wrong and I am freaked out. I am the same for that. I check my email multiple times a day. Even when I'm on vacation, I know I shouldn't do that. But I, I can't help it. I need to know what's going on. But I'm not to the level of Sean where I need to open every email. So if I see an email, especially if it's from a retailer and it's just like, you know, classic sales email, I'll delete that without thinking twice. But I do check it a lot and I can't have any unread notifications. That makes me crazy. I'm the same way about unread notifications, but I never delete the emails ever unless they're like spam unless i know uh even if it's one that i'm like that probably won't be relevant again there's part of my brain that goes you might need that you never know you might need that temporary code from your one account <laughs> <laughs> do you do you sort them or is it all in your inbox oh they're all in the inbox thousands tens of thousands of red emails i don't mark i don't keep them as unread um but i think the thing that makes me want to open it immediately is usually based on the subject line. Because if it's from somebody from work and like it's after I've gotten off work, I try to do the life work-life balance thing where I'm like, oh, I'll read that tomorrow or whatever. But I'll check just in case. And if the subject is like something that I'm like, oh, that's something I should be thinking about ahead of work tomorrow, I'll do it. But if it's more like, a, do you remember to log your hours before the end of the month or something, I'll be like, I'll open that tomorrow. And I feel like it's, like, it's the same way with uh, email from other people too, like businesses and whatnot. If I'm like, oh, that's maybe that is something I'll I'd want to buy, or like that's a good deal in the subject line, then I, I'm more willing to click on it and open it and read it right then. How do you think email is more or less effective than other channels? I agree with what you sort of said at the beginning, which, where you, you know, you own that platform and you're being more direct in that way. For me. Getting an email is definitely more effective than seeing, I think, an ad on Facebook, even if I do parse those emails a lot and, and delete them and unsubscribe a whole bunch. It is, I think, more effective because it is reaching the inbox that I am checking multiple times a day. And I would I am definitely seeing that that email that you sent me. Um, so I do think it's more effective than maybe an ad on Facebook that I might not see or I might scroll by real quickly. If I've subscribed to your list already... I'm probably interested in what you're selling since I've already kind of done that first round of screening. If it's in my inbox, I'm taking, you know, a closer look at it than I would an ad. So, yeah, I would say a lot more effective. There's something about the experience of social media that feels like it's made to be like all fun and that there's something about email that feels more like all business. And so I think there's something to that where like, yes, you're not getting direct to a user experience. And this is purely me anecdotal evidence. This is not based in research or anything. But there's part of me that is like probably more willing to click on an ad on Instagram because that's like my social media of choice than to open an email that's probably saying the same information because it's on email. And I don't know. That could be a generational thing. That could be a just literally just my brain. <laughs> and that's how I think about it kind of thing. Similar to Ben, I do think that I might be more likely to click on an Instagram ad. Same, that's my platform of choice. But I do like an email, you get more information. So you have more text opportunity. You have more images you can link to. Um, if there's a sale coming up, it's easier to get all of the pertinent details. So I think that, yeah, it's kind of a flip for me, I guess. There's just different purposes to those, to each of those tactics. Well, let's dig into some of the... <laughs> elements that go into an email because there's a lot and honestly we will not have time to unpack everything today um, but a few quick stats there are more than four billion people who use email around the world and 
306 billion emails are sent each day. Now, it's unclear if this information uh, also from, I don't know how you say this, Statista? Statista? I'm sorry, company. I use your research a lot, but I need to check a pronunciation I guide on you. I thought it was Statista because it makes me think of Dave Bautista, the actor slash wrestler. <laughs> Or someone at Starbucks who is a barista. Exactly. That's kind of how I was thinking it. Exactly. Um, but anyway, it's unclear. Are those personal emails? Are those entirely business emails? No matter how you slice it, that's a lot of emails. A few different elements go into that. We've already talked a little bit about subject lines. Research has been done to say what words will perform better. Uh, things like truth, actual, real, like you want the real truth about what actually happened? It, you know, kind of the clickbait of email subject lines. Uh, but I'd love to start off by talking a bit about design. Um, and Sean, this is kind of your your world a little bit. Um, what goes into having an effective looking email once someone does succumb to that subject line and decide to open it? I think the biggest thing is just make it as clean and simple as you can. The majority of email clients, even if you're on a giant desktop, are going to be small screens. No one's, I shouldn't say no one, but the majority of people probably are not opening up their mail app full screen to see your email as large as a, a website would. So it's already going to be kind of small. If they're on a phone, it's going to be even smaller. And anybody who is using Gmail well, then that's also inside of a browser. So you've got a window inside a window. So you're not going to have a lot of room. So no columns. Uh, you know, it's going to be scrolling up and down. So single column. And then, you know, nice photo, clear text, clear call to action um, for your design. You, you don't need to be doing anything complex because of all those limitations with how it's going to be viewed and so many devices and different programs and applications that the email goes through. So the, the less amount of complexity you can add, the more likely that is going to get across in the way that you want and get through various filters and blockers as well that you have to deal with when sending an email to people. I'm not a designer, but I would just add that it should match your current branding. So anything that you push out on any platform, but email in particular, it should be your brand colors. It should have your logo. And just when you're styling it, keep those elements in mind. I was also going to give a tip from a non-designer perspective that I that works for me. And I think it's worked too when we are trying to do online content, but could be transferable to email is like the visual hierarchy. What's the most important thing you want them to know? Make it either the like the biggest or first or both and usually is the preference. And then yeah, don't make me scroll to get to the thing that you wanted me to see because you think, well, I want them to read this first and then they can get their prize. I think most people will just click off if they don't see the thing that they actually came for. Yeah, that's actually a good point because if you imagine a lot of times people are like me clicking on an email to initially view it and and things like Gmail, when you click an email, you'll get like the the preview, which you'll see the top of. So sometimes the top might be the only part that they're going to look at before they decide that they're going to delete it or read it. So putting the important messages up at the top is very important. Yeah, sort of like the website or a newspaper above the fold. So what are some thoughts that you all might have around um, calls to action? How much content goes into an email? This goes hand in hand with what Ben just said. So the most pertinent information at the top and being very, very clear and specific what do you want people to do? Do you want them to shop now? Do you want them to learn more about this sale? Do you want them to register for something? So say that really early. And then buttons. People like to click on buttons. We all love a button. So include those wherever you can. This is something, a conversation Julia and I had recently about buttons like in articles. It's just like give them multiple ways to click through to a thing. So it can be in the title, it could be on the photo for the article, and there can be a d dedicated button with the call to action to it. Because people are going to have different uh, instincts in terms to, of where they click and how they want to get there. And it really is sometimes is like the difference between getting like a conversion, like a click through 
could be how many times do I have to try to click something before I go, ah, it's broken, and then I move away. It's a really small thing, but it, it, I think it makes the experience feel that much smoother. And then they're more likely to get further into where you want them to go. And after they've clicked on your email, a great thing about email is all of the data that you can mine from that. So regardless of platform, whatever you're using, assuming you're not individually typing these emails, there's a wealth of data there. So how many people clicked on the button? How many people clicked on the link above? And then kind of molding your future strategy to incorporate more of those things. So that can be really interesting. And maybe trying a good mix of those in the beginning, seeing what pans out well, and then kind of adjusting from there in the future. And to Sean's point about mobile devices earlier, it can be hard to click on just the linked text with your fat little finger, you know? Nice big button, you can hit that sucker. Or a pet peeve of mine is if I click on an image and it's not linked. Like, what? What? Let's talk a little bit about frequency. So given that there are different types of email newsletters, there's going to be a difference between, oh, here's an update that I know and expect and look forward to, or here's a news roundup versus, my dear Lord, how many one-day sales can Macy's have? Like, <laughs> seriously, 365, one day only. Enough. But like, what kind of what's your, what's your personal threshold on frequency? And then I'm going to dazzle you with some facts. Yeah, I. this is one of those where I know you're going to tell me that the data is opposite of what I want. And I'm going to be disheartened. <laughs> um, because, yeah, I, I only want to hear from a brand a couple times a month, uh, depending on what it is. Um, there are some places that you're, I think, you're more inclined to be like, okay, yeah, you, you might have a sale a couple times and I get that. But some places who continually uh, repeat like, hey, we're having a sale. Did you do you yesterday? I sent you an email that we're having a sale. Did you get that email? And I don't want that type of thing. I don't want a repeated message of the same message. And that's probably because, yes, I did see that email. I clicked on it. I paid attention. Um, so it's insulting to me that you would send it to me again. Um but yeah, so not not very frequently. Otherwise, I get pretty frustrated uh, and I will unsubscribe if you continually hound me. Um, but that's just me. Mine definitely depends also a lot on what the message is. So if it's like a politician that I've subscribed to, if they're emailing me every day asking me to donate, I'm going to unsubscribe. That's too much. You're being needy and I don't want to deal with it. So that's, no, every day is too much if you're asking me to donate to your cause. If, however, it's something I really enjoy, like some of the more content-heavy or marketing-specific emails that I subscribe to, I really don't mind hearing from them multiple times a week because I like their emails and they're not asking me to give them anything. They're giving me something. So I think it depends a lot on the message and the ask. Yeah, I, th I think my gut reaction was like one per week is my absolute limit. But then what Addy was saying about when they're providing content that you're interested in consuming, I'm like, yeah, if I missed it on Monday and you want to remind me on Tuesday, yeah, you know what? Send it to me. I'm down for that. But for most part, when it's like you want me to go do something for you, yeah, maybe once a week is my hard, <laughs> hard limit. I would also add, I think there's something to setting expectations like there's an email newsletter I get that's weekly. I know it's weekly. It comes out on Thursday. And I know that it's going to be a quick five-minute read. And then I'll get some food for thought in it. Shout out James Clear, Atomic Habits. Um, there's another one where it's a fortnightly email newsletter. So every two weeks, I know it's coming out. Shout out Anne Handley. But kind of setting that expectation, this is how frequently you'll hear from us. And some places will let you toggle, like when you, if you do click to unsubscribe, some will just be like, okay, bye, see you later. And others will say, do you want fewer emails? How often should we email you? So I think that's setting that expectation is a part of it. But Sean, yes, to your point, uh, the data actually shows that more people click, the more you send to them. 
And it's sort of like, we will wear you down until you give us that click. And that, to me, feels like a hollow click, I, I've got to say. Some clicks are worth more than others. <laughs> right, exactly. I want your happy click, not your I've crushed your soul click. Um but yeah, data shows that emails sent three times over three days versus twice over three days increased the response rate by over 25% in business to business and business to consumer. Yeah, I think um, that's just to hammer that home is a great example of just not going with what you think makes sense or going with your gut on things and like really looking into data for a lot of things because that's just one like – that I would never consider until the data says otherwise. And then you would just have to be like, yep, that's if you want to do that sort of transaction, that's what you need to be doing because it it works. And even though it doesn't work on me, I'm the outlier. It's something that we look at with digital, though. There's data, but there's also brand and voice. And, you know, maybe that won't be your brand and your voice. And that's OK. Be authentic to what your business does and who you are so even if the data says one thing you can still do what makes sense for you so one other thing that came up that i think we should talk about this was something i didn't i never thought was a good thing and i actually heard uh, at a presentation someone said unsubscribes are fine you actually want those people to call themselves out of your list because Whatever interested them in the first place, they're no longer interested. So no matter how many times or how you reach out to them, you're probably not going to get a lot of traction with them. It's spam reports that you have to worry about. If someone says, no, this is too spammy, I don't know where it's coming from, I don't trust it, those will ding you. Unsubscribes don't affect your spam score at all. And I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, on a, on a technical side of this as someone who deals with the sort of server end of sending a bunch of emails, that's absolutely right. The The unsubscribes do not, do not matter, but spam reports matter a lot and can, you know, essentially block or blacklist you if you get too many spam, uh, spam reports. So email providers, internet service providers are, are looking at who is sending emails and how are they being reacted to specifically by by spam reports? And um, that will cause you a, <laughs> can cause you a lot of uh, headache uh, where unsubscribes are, are not that at all. Well, as we wrap up with final thoughts, I actually got an email today that I reported as spam. And sometimes I really want to be snarky with people. So the subject line used a tactic that data says you should do, which is personalization. So it had my first name. And then it had brackets, and then it had the sender's first name. That was the subject line. So Julie, side bracket, side bracket, Andy. And I kind of wanted to, like, open it up and write back and be, like, not interested, Andy. Or really, my brain went to something a lot more rude and snarkier. I hold myself back because I think there might be a person on the other end of that. Like... I don't want to bring that negativity into the world, but I also don't want that email. Similarly, Julie, I once received an email where everything was still bracket first name, bracket last name, insert here. I was like, oh, man, because I'd filled out a form to get more information. So I was a very interested customer who received then this blank blanket insert name, insert last name. And I actually did reply. I wasn't rude, but I was just like, hey, just so you know, this wasn't filled out, no longer interested, thanks, but, you know, just so you know, this wasn't completed. Because maybe they didn't know, maybe it was automated and no one had gotten in there, but yeah, just double check everything. Make sure everything's been proofread multiple times by multiple people. Check your systems. PSA. I don't like the too hyper-personal style of email um, that uh, at least I get on the the business end a ton um, where it no longer looks like a professional email. It looks like one that they they wrote personally 
in their email app. So it, it looks like a person sent it to you, even though it's it's a mass email. And so they're trying to trick me into thinking like someone actually typed this up. And I don't I don't appreciate that. I would rather you have at least put in some effort and design to have your logo and look like a business email. And you can put my name and all the other stuff in that. That's fine. Um, but trying to like fake like, oh, yeah, I'm just your buddy. And I just typed you this email and sent out. That's insult. I feel like the people don't want to feel like they're being tricked. You can be playful and jokey, but they don't want to feel like the butt of the joke. They want to feel like they're in on the joke. Like they're like, oh, we're friends, we're palling, but like we're both aware of what this is, which is I want you to read my blog or I want you to go to my website and check out the the newest thing that I'm selling. You know, don't go into the into the process with the mindset of we're going to fool them into thinking we're their friends, you know, be honest about who you are and what you're putting forward, but have fun with it if that fits your brand and the tone that you've set. Excellent. Hey, buddy, want to grab a beer later? No. Maybe read this yeah. email first? <laughs> no, no. Amazon.com. I'm not <laughs> right. going to grab a beer with it's, you. Yeah. And it's very similar to, I think, a lot of sales tactics and that I don't enjoy where I, I know you're a salesman trying to sell me something. So let's both just agree that we are aware of that this is happening and don't act like I don't know that. And you can still pitch me all your things. That's fine. But don't I don't know. Don't act like I'm going to be uh, amazed and wowed. Like, I don't realize that that's, that's what you're doing. Like, let's be frank and honest with each other. And I think in, in all forms, that works the best. Excellent points. Excellent thoughts, you guys. Thanks for another great episode. Um, before we head out, I actually have um, I have a passion for, like, how our minds work and human behavior and even how, like, in the natural world, how how and why animals do certain things. And so Nick shared this story, uh, this kind of research fact with me, and I thought it was really interesting. So scientists have been studying koi fish, and they learned that they travel in packs of four. Um, and scientists for ease classify them with letters just to identify their specific roles. So they notice that when a predator attacks, that the A, B, and C koi will kind of scatter, and the only one left behind is the D koi. koi. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting. I was yeah. waiting for the shoe it, to drop. It took me longer than I'd like to admit that I was like, wait a minute, this is going to end in a joke. I need to be prepared. <laughs> it was so smooth. I thought it was, it was, it was a fact really, for too long. It was really good. <laughs> Nick, oh, did I do you proud, a- buddy? Thumbs up I got a thumbs up. Nick. I'll Fantastic. take that. 10 out of 10 for sure. The journey, yep. the payoff. <laughs> loved it. Thank you for listening to this episode of Almost Productive. Before we go, we'd like to give a shout out to our producers, Nick and Molly, who work behind the scenes to make this podcast possible. If you'd like to learn more about what we do at New Boston Creative Group, you can reach out to us at newbostoncreative.com. You can also follow us on social media at New Boston Creative on Instagram and New Boston Creative Group on Facebook and LinkedIn. If you liked this episode, please like, follow, subscribe, leave a review, and share the podcast with your friends. And if you didn't like the show, feel free to recommend us to your enemies. Tune in next time for some more office shenanigans, thoughts on trending topics, and marketing-adjacent insights. Until next time, we hope you have a productive day. All right, well, bye. (laughs) <laughs> Bye. <laughs> See We're late. Get out of here. Go home. Hey, friend, you want to go get a beer? No. Hey, it's Terry's friend. Oh, it's me, Larry. <laughs> Terry and Larry. Wherever Terry and Larry are, I'm not there. <laughs> That's okay, uh, no. Yeah, let us know where you're going before you go. <laughs>